So, the other day I built a signal generator with moderate levels of incompetence. I was going to also build the matching frequency counter to go with it, but didn't have time. So let's do that now. This is a cheap $10 frequency counter from Banggood produced by Geekcrite. It's a kit which I need to assemble. And I have not opened this before other than to take this cable out. So let's have a look and see what we get. We have a PIC 16F628A microcontroller with a socket and the display for the frequency. What this is, it will measure the frequency of an incoming signal and display it here, which I need for work on the flux engine. Bag full of components, a box and the PCB. The box is, it looks like exactly the same laser cut acrylic that I had such a difficulty with for the, uh, the signal generator, which I should actually demonstrate, which is here. The, uh, the box fastens together in a rather unobvious way and I had uh, difficulty figuring it out and I ended up having to glue it together. Uh, some instructions that are probably in mangled English. A yellow double-sided PCB. This is interesting compared to the other one. Well, the other one was a red PCB, but the manufacturing was different. The pads were smaller and the holes were bigger. So, uh, yeah, I don't know what that will, how much effect that will be on the construction. Smaller holes should mean more secure component mounting. The acrylic case is just as usual. Uh, it does not appear to have the the weird uh, cog pattern in the holes that the bolts were supposed to screw into. So probably the bolts just go straight through in a much more conventional fashion. What do we have here? Some bags of capacitors, a socket, some diodes, a couple of transistors, a clock crystal, always a good sign for a frequency counter because that means it might be right. A button and a switch for the button. Nice switch, good and clicky. Okay, what have we got in terms of resistors? Are all these the same? These all look the same. These are different. This one is different again. So you have three types of resistor. Some uh, ceramic capacitors, no electrolytics. This is the mount for the, the input signal. Uh, this is interesting. So we've got a socket and we've got three jumpers. I wonder if that's supposed to go together. Okay, let's take a look at the manual. Frequency counter installation instructions. Uh, this looks diode black in the negative. That seems all reasonably well, reasonably clear and translated. Five volt voltage regulator, uh, that'll be one of these. Two transistors and a U1. Uh, here we go, U2 and U3 NPN transistors, yep. Oh boy. The welding installation considerations follow these steps. The components are welding the front board from low to high principles, namely the first low welding components. Yeah, this is the same instructions as the, uh, the signal generator. The welding microcontroller header and then welding triode button a power outlet. The back with the diagonal cutting pliers to cut the, short the pins as far as possible. 
using the step. Before measuring signal, please switch J1 jumper cap. Blue terminals for the in. Uh, before measuring crystal, please switch the J1 jumper cap. Ah, right, you can switch this between measuring the frequency of an incoming signal or measuring uh, a crystal. That's cool. We have a circuit diagram, a QR code, and nothing on the back. Okay, so let's rearrange things a bit. Right, uh, well, we need to go from low to high principles. Chris First, low welding components, crystals, capacitors, resistors, diodes, round hole of seats. Okay, so let's try the resistors. We have uh, three, six, nine of these resistors, R6 to R13, 1K resistor. Actually, I'm going to go with the lone resistor first. Just to be on the safe side, uh, stick it in my component tester. Hundred K resistor. There should be a single hundred K, which is R one, and R one goes there. Yeah, that's pretty good. It's a nice tight fit so the component stays put. Okay, soldering iron is hot. Leaded solder. That did not feel like a good joint. That's fine. Good. Uh, next step, let's go for these three. These are uh, these are probably the 10k resistors labeled here. But just to be on the safe side. Ten K. R two, R three, and R five. R two is here. So what this is, is a PIC microcontroller based device. It will count pulses on the signal. There'll be some analog electronics to uh, actually couple it with the signal. It is a very small computer. Uh, I actually have a programmer. I'm not sure it'll work on PICs. I'm, if I really wanted to, I could probably reprogram this to do something else. I probably don't want to. Pick assembly is kind of weird. I've done a little bit of programming in it. This is a pick 16, I believe. Yeah, that's an interesting choice. I wonder why they didn't use a 12, which is smaller and cheaper. So, the pick instruction set is extremely peculiar. It's got a handful of bytes of memory mapped to registers. So it doesn't really distinguish between I.O. devices and RAM. It's got, uh, depending on which version of the PIC you're using, the instruction set varies from 11 bits, maybe 12 bits up. So the program 
held in flash uses a weird width of flash memory. Uh, I think it's 14 actually. So trying to actually copy programs into RAM, which is 8 bits wide, is very peculiar. Uh, R2, R3, where is R3? Uh, R1, R3, R2, R5. I need R5 next. Where is R5? R2, diode. R4? No, that's a, that's a 1K. Uh, where is R5? A bunch of resistors here. Capacitor, capacitor, clock crystal, capacitor, jumper, jumper, capacitor, R4. No, I want R5. Uh, there it is. Right, it's pretending to be a diode. A row of diodes with the resistor next to it. So now I want to put in all the 1K resistors, which should be all the rest. And again, just double check. Uh, helps if you plug it in. 1K, 1,003 ohms. I have no idea how accurate that thing is. I suspect not very, but it is very good as a quick and easy sanity check to make sure I've done everything right. Right, R4 is a 1K resistor. Okay, all the other resistors go in this bank up here, I believe. This uh, three, six, and eight. Yep, eight of them. R6 to R13, so R6. Let's see if I can get this, try and get this one a bit straighter. R8. It doesn't matter which way around you put resistors, but just for neatness, let's have all the stripes lined up the same way. not very neat. Uh, R9. Haven't 
Having all the stripes lined up the same way also makes it more obvious if the wrong resistor gets in the mix. And R10. And we put all the components in so that we can solder all the legs together in a group, which is substantially simpler. And easier and quicker. All right. So the last three is R eleven, twelve, and thirteen. This is R12. So looking at the, ah yes, looking at the circuit diagram, which is just off the top of the screen, so you can't see it. These are the resistors for the seven segment display LEDs. You notice that there are fewer resistors than there are segments. Uh, LEDs are not ohmic devices, which means the current through them does not vary in proportion to the uh, the resistance. So you have to have a resistor in series with an LED to keep the current under control, otherwise uh, you blow the LED. And you may notice that the uh, there are uh, eight resistors, but the seven segment display has a lot more than eight LEDs in it, because each digit is made out of eight LEDs. Seven for the digit itself and one for the dot. And the way this works is that probably only one digit is displayed at a time and the pick will rapidly cycle through all the digits displaying each one in turn for a brief moment of time and persistence of vision means that you can't actually tell this it looks like a constant display but it means that because only eight leds are ever energized at one time you only need eight resistors And, just as importantly, far fewer connections to the module. OK, let's remove some of these wires. That should be all the resistors. Component legs are worth keeping. It's amazing how frequently a short piece of stiff wire comes in handy.
So that was all the resistors. I think next I'll do the diodes as they are smaller than the other components. And we do, after all, have to go from low to high principles. All right. So here are the diodes. Let's just sweep this away a bit. Diodes are polarized. They only go in one way around. So now it says on the instructions, D1 to D5 diode, black in the negative. So these are these diodes here and D1 there. Um, I assume that the stripe matches up. There is a black stripe at one end of the diode, which is the negative side. So we can actually, using the trusty testing tool, Yes, uh, the arrow indicates the direction of current flow, so the black is the negative side. It would be nice if the PCB actually had a plus or a minus on it, but there is a stripe marked. So, diode. And now we do the other four, which are this bank here. Uh, what are the diodes for? Be these four here. I can't tell off the top of my head. They are connected to a transistor. Uh, they're also connected to the lines for the LED. The internal resistors on picks, are, uh, the internal transistors on picks are quite powerful, so they're used a lot for powering LEDs. So I just wonder what this transistor is for. The transistor is connected to the LED bank, so maybe that is to do with powering the, uh, the LED display. Hmm. Anyway, let's get these diodes mounted. very elegantly, I have to say. All, right, all the black stripes are at the top, so time to do the soldering. That one moved slightly when I was as I was soldering it.
Okay. Those joints seem to be all right. So that would be the diodes. What we've got next are, oh yeah, the unpolarized capacitors, these little brown things, and they're all different. So the instructions have got two 0.1 microfarad capacitors labeled 104, one 102, 222p. 22 picofarad. So we've got a 104, a 102, a 22, that's probably the 22p, that's another 104, another 22, 22, yeah there are four of these 22s. Right, so let's do the 102, that's the old one. That is C6, C6 is here. It's even more or less upright. Uh, yes, that does say 102 and it is in C6. Uh, the 104s go in C1 and C7. So, C1 is here and C7 are, is next to it. Actually, so this is right next to U1 here. Uh, I'm not going to do those. I'm going to work sideways. So let's go with C2. C2 is the 22P. I wonder what the 22P is. It is a... Not known. Yeah, I don't know what that is, and neither does the machine. So 22p in C2, yes, that goes in here. Next to it is C3, that is another 22p. Then we get to C7, which is a 104. And then we get U1. What is U1? It is a five voltage regulator. Five voltage regulator, 7550-1. That will be one of these uh, packages. That's a 
So there's a 58050, right, that's an NPN transistor. 58050, therefore they must be this one. 7550-1, yep. Uh, I assume it goes this way round. Judging by the shape of the silk screen. So we'll go in like this. I hope. Wouldn't make any sense the other way around. Uh, looking at the tracks, I can see this is where the barrel connector goes. I can see the ground is connected to this bottom pin. Uh, voltage to the middle pin and the output 5 volt is going to, is from the top pin. So that seems to make sense. Okay. Be nicer if there's a little bit more assistance on the board. Yeah, the reason I'm doing them in this order is so that I have space to work. I don't have to solder components between two other components. Right, C1 is the other 104, that's this one. This C1 here is a smoothing capacitor between ground and the input voltage. Yeah, yeah, these are both smoothing capacitors. C1, this one, is smoothing before regulation and C7 is smoothing after regulation. What they do is they soak up any spikes or glitches in the power supply voltage so that the voltage that the pick, the processor sees, is reasonably level. Okay. So there are only two more capacitors, which are these 22s, and. These must be C4 and C5, which are here. Right, again, there are three components in a row, so I will do them in that order. Now, I happen to know uh, from the, the circuit, these two capacitors are used by the clock. which is this clock crystal. The clock provides, no, the clock crystal provides the frequency reference that drives the pick and also is used to, um, <clears throat> and is used to measure the frequency. And you need a clock crystal and two capacitors, so that's C4 and C5 here. Uh, that's going to fall out if I turn the board over. Clock crystals are fairly fragile, so I actually need to be careful with this. They are also unpolarized, so it doesn't matter which way around I put it. He says just after he checks the circuit diagram. Which I should have done before I actually soldered the thing on, but never mind.
Okay, and our last capacitor. All right. And remove the wires. I am not sure why these are sticking to the uh, wire cutters because these wires are supposed to be copper and copper is not magnetic. Maybe it's just that the wire cutters are slightly sticky. These will not be the greatest components. They will be sourced from uh, come on, fairly low end manufacturers, but there's why isn't that cutting? Oh, huh, they managed to solder two wires together. Interesting. Okay. So we've got a lot of stuff. Uh, what do we have left? We've got two NPN transistors, and these are identical. They are both 58050s. They are. What does the component tester think they are? Uh, it's a diode. Um, yeah, Com transistors and diodes are pretty similar, so I'm not surprised it gets that wrong. And these would go into U2 and U3. I'm going to assume that the rounded side matches. That one goes in there. in there. Let's straighten those up a little. Right, solder. What's next? Uh, we have the input and output terminal, which goes here. Uh, but we also have J1, so let's put that on first. J1 is three pin jumper cap. That will be this. I assume it's that. Yes. This goes on here. And immediately falls out.
now we can put on this. This is the screw terminal for the input signal. That goes in. <laughs> Spoke too soon. I need the tape again. Okay, uh, crystal tester. This is the socket here for attaching a crystal. If we had the, if this worked, I could then demonstrate using the crystal that this uses. But I wouldn't be able to because I wouldn't be able to test that crystal without removing the crystal and then it wouldn't work. Makes sense really. I'm, I actually one think I might have a crystal somewhere. That's worth a try. We are rapidly running out of components, which is what I like to see. Right, that has not worked right. Uh, the crystal has, uh, the socket has moved when I plug the thing in, so it's actually standing a bit proud of the board. Fixing this is going to be tricky because uh, I need to melt all three connections simultaneously. Ow! And then burn myself. Or, you know, that looks fine, it'll do. So here is the jumper, it's one of the same jumpers with a tag on it for easy access that the function generator used. Uh, what is left? Well not much really, we've got the barrel connector for the power. Big thick chunky pads that take a while to heat up. Okay, that's reasonably level. I think this board is noticeably better than the other one. It, the solder is wicking through the wires very nicely. Uh, what do we have next? Well, there's the socket for the processor. Uh, we have the dimple indicating the top, which matches the diagram, the image on the silk screen. So that will go on here. And let's tape that down. That's not worked very well. What do we have I can prop this up on? That will do. Just one solder spot is enough to hold it in place. Notice that one of the pads, that one there, is square. That's another way to mark pin one on the chip.
Those are all the pins. Yep, that looks fine. Okay, so we now have the LCD module. The LCD module is U4. LED displays by screen printing layer. Now, I would rather like it if there was a socket for this, but there isn't. So I'm just going to have to solder the thing directly to the board. This means that if I get it wrong, I will never get it off again, at least intact. Uh, also, the pins are not quite going through the holes. Come on, they don't quite line up with the PCB. There we go. And that is luckily tight enough that it fits. Right, double check it's the right way around. You see the dots on the LCD module are on the bottom, which they are here. And solder time. should now be firmly soldered in place, never to be moved again. And there is only one more component, which is the switch, which is here. The switch is this one, S1 switch, S1 regardless of the polarity. So this goes on here, whoops. That leg has been bent. There we go. And that stays in place reasonably well. Yeah, this is working really well. The solder is easily melting and flowing smoothly into the the holes. The holes are plated on the inside just as with the other board because it's a double-sided board so yeah that's good. That's it. That's all the components. So all we need to do is attach the button insert the chip the right way around. Just need to bend the legs together a bit. Uh, not quite that far. Do not know why the legs of chips are always a bit splayed, because it makes them hard to fit into the sockets. The software for the chip has been pre-programmed, I hope. There we go. Uh, so now all we need to do is to plug it in and see how it works, which I shall just do. Alright, so here we have the signal generator that I built yesterday. 
and this is connected to my bench power supply at 9.4 volts because this needs 9 volts to run and it's configured for a sine wave and with some random stuff. This however is plugged into USB and it's producing 5 volts. So we plug this in here and see what happens. It's a number. Is that showing up on the screen? No, on the camera? Let's try that. It says 0.144. So if I adjust one of these knobs, very nice. This is fine. This is coarse. I don't know what the scale is. Oh, hang on, uh, I've missed, missed a step. I've missed a step. Um, I need to insert the cap. Uh, this, the jumper, this needs to be here to say that I want to measure a signal. Zero. Uh, what does the button do? Nothing much. Intriguing. So looking at the looking at the instructions. It does say, uh, before measuring signals, switch J1 jumper cap. Blue terminals for the in for signal input. Yeah, that's this one. So why is that registering zero? Is the amplitude not enough for it to register? It was working with the, with the jumper removed. Ah, yes, I forgot about this. Uh, all these knobs are backwards. So if we turn this clockwise, the amplitude goes down. So that wants to be there for maximum amplitude. So if I turn this clockwise, the frequency increases. I assume this is megahertz. doesn't register anything. Nothing. Two hundred, four hundred, nothing. I think what's happening is as the frequency goes up, the voltage goes down and eventually this stops measuring it. So what about this one? Thirty kilohertz maybe? And this one? These do seem to be powers of ten. Oh yeah, there is actually a label. Right, one to ten hertz. It is measuring in kilohertz, not megahertz. So that is 0.3 kilohertz. So if I stick this up to this one, this is the 100 to 3 kilohertz range. So that is... Five hundred hertz. Yeah, I don't really follow what this is doing. It's showing a number, which I hope is showing up on the screen. Is that better? So it says zero point two one six. Oh yeah, I can do this too.
much better, at least for me. Uh, so this is going down. And the minimum rate, the minimum level is 140 odd. So that must be 140 hertz. So we turn the knob up and that's fine. This one's coarse. Two hundred, three hundred, four hundred. And suddenly the number drops off. Interesting. Uh, let me make a small adjustment. So this is currently connected to the sine wave output for the signal generator. So let's put it in this one. This is the square wave output. And if anyone actually watched the other day's video, the square wave, the amplitude is always about 10 volts. So this is showing six, 700. And that stops. Well, let's try it with the jumper in. I don't know what the button does. Let's power cycle it, see what happens. That's better. Number's quite small. And the knob seems to have no effect on the reading. That says... 0 0.19 well it's changing this is the 10 to 100 hertz range so if that is registering 7 hertz if it's measuring kilohertz so one end of the range is 7 and the other is 19 Yeah, I have. I don't think this is doing anything particularly useful. The numbers just seem to be randomly. And under debugging steps, check the IC weather against, such as anti please timely correction. Who knows what that means? After the check, the electricity, the fourth digital tube display zero. Said the installation was successful. So if I unplug this, fourth display is registering zero. Well, that was an adventure. I do finally have it working, as you can see by the uh, 0.2 registered here. Uh, and I'm going to explain what the problem was and why I need this extra board with the help of my trusty oscilloscope, which should be appearing up there somewhere. So currently it's showing a flat zero volts. That just means noise. This is what the signal generator is producing and you can see that there's a pretty hefty DC offset of about uh, four and a half volts and it turns out that as I thought the frequency counter requires the signal to cross zero volts before it is counted uh, so 
In order to remove the DC offset, I need to decouple the signal to remove the DC offset, which I do using a decoupling capacitor and a resistor to bias the output towards zero. Uh, this is what the frequency counter is actually seeing. And you can see that the DC offset has been mostly removed. It's going from about plus five to about minus one volts. Uh, you can change the amount of offset that is removed by changing the value of the resistor. The smaller the resistor, the closer the result will be to zero. Unfortunately, the smaller the resistor, the smaller the output signal. So if the output signal gets too small, the frequency counter just can't count it anymore. This appears to be a reasonable compromise. It's crossing zero enough. It's going negative enough that it's actually managing to count. I can adjust the amplitude. So if I reduce the amplitude to here, you can see that the counter just stops being able to count it and starts producing gibberish. So let's crank that back up until about there. That's the point where uh, it starts to clip. So that does seem to be working. This is registering in kilohertz. I found the manual. The slow flashing decimal point indicates that the result is in kilohertz. So we're seeing about a 200 hertz signal and I can wind that up. You can see the frequency increase and it counts. And if we go, that's over a kilohertz, that's two and a bit kilohertz. Uh, we have the jumper here in the 100 hertz, three kilohertz range. So that's up the top of the range. That's pretty good. Let's go up a step and let's adjust the oscilloscope to get more of a signal. So the we still have the slow flashing dots. It's still in kilohertz. So we can continue to wind this up. And eventually uh, we get a fast flashing dot which according to the manual means something else, but that is still reading in kilohertz. Interesting. But that goes up to 40-ish. It says 65 on here. What's the next range up to? 72. Uh, Right, the, the, you see that's now flashing even faster. It's supposed to indicate the, uh, the unit it's measured in, but I think the manual is wrong and all it's doing is registering which uh, digit the ones digit is. So the decimal point is always showing kilohertz. That's 120 kilohertz, oh, wrong way. Uh, that's showing on the oscilloscope a 10, about a 10 microsecond peak between two successive waves. And this goes all the way up to, this says a megahertz, that says 650 kilohertz, which I reckon is about right. The as you wind the frequency up on this, the amplitude goes down, so uh, it's only just going negative. Yeah, so that was weird. But uh, now that I've sorted out what's happening, that seems to be fairly plausible. I believe that the DC offset on the signal generator is intentional. You're supposed to use a capacitor to decouple it and you need quite a big capacitance. 
and I believe the DC offset is there so that you can use one of these polarized electrolytic capacitors because you can guarantee that this side is a higher voltage than this side and because these things are polarized and have to go in the right way around this makes life easier. If there wasn't a DC offset you wouldn't be able to use an electrolytic and you'd have to use a much more expensive uh, non-polarized capacitor. So yeah, I believe that works. So there's only one more bit to do, which is to assemble the case. I have taken all the brown tape off the uh, perspex because that's really boring. So let us unwire this and put it together and let's have a look and see what the result looks like. Not sure what I'm going to do about the need to decouple it. I suppose ideally the uh, the capacitor and the decoupling resistor would be adjustable and somewhere on this. I might need to build a board. Right. I'm not really into PCB manufacture, unfortunately. Should be easy enough to make one. So how does this go together? This is clearly the bottom. This is clearly the top because this goes over here. So I believe that it just bolts onto the uh, bolts onto the bottom sheet. So that would probably be the small bolts. To be honest, the frequency counter seems rather more useful than the signal generator, given the slight weirdness of the signal generator. And I'm probably going to have to put the side pieces on this box before putting the board on. Let's just double check that. This has the notch on it. So that will go here, yeah. Uh, this is got the notch for the output. So that means that this one goes here and this one goes here. Okay, right, I can do that without needing to take the board off. So let's do the rest of these bolts up. These laser cut acrylic cases are primitive but effective. Uh, right, the, the lugs of the DC jack project more, project further than the other. Uh, pins. So in fact the board, they're touching the acrylic and the board is bending. So I might need to be a bit clever. How many bolts did they give us? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Right, I know how this is supposed to work. Hopefully I'll make a bit less of a dog's dinner of this than I did the, the box for the frequency counter which is now held together by glue. Right, the way I believe this works is that these bolts go on here and these then form the stands that hold the PCB off the bottom of the case. So 
And now I'm looking at it, I wonder if I'd be better off with the bolts on the top and the screws going up. Let's just try putting it together and seeing how big things are. So you see then this goes on here. And the more bolts hold the PCB on. So it's actually going to stand on these. Uh, yeah, let's actually take this apart and put the bolts on the other way up. to go assembled this way up this time. And then the bolts that hold the top of the case on will go the other way and that will form four nice feet for the thing to stand on, I hope. sits on like this and ha okay that does go on I thought for a moment that the bolt wouldn't go round because of the uh, the LED unit next to it but in fact it does go on and it's got crossed don't want these too tight. All right, so that seems good and solid. Now we put these on. At the side where the for the connector here, we have the side for the power jack. Is that going to go on? There we go. And we've got the two blank sides. This goes on top. Uh, is that right? It seems to not. There we go. There we go. Right. So these bolts go through like this. They seem to have given us more nuts than were really required, but not enough for two nuts in the spacer. Because if the board was supposed to come up another uh, row of nuts, you'd need a four extra, but in fact we only have two. And looking at the way that the Looking at the size of the case, there's clearly no not enough room for an extra four nuts. This is the right size. Okay, that is not moving smoothly, so. 
So we appear to just have three extra. I suspect they just put a handful in the bag and didn't actually count them. All right, there we go. In a fairly neat box, we have the jumper for the uh, you've got to be careful because this is actually the 9 volt supply. This is the 5 volt supply. Yes, this is the jumper that it selects between measuring the, the frequency of a signal and measuring the frequency of a crystal. Uh, when the when this is in the bottom two holes, it actually connects a pull-up resistor and bypasses the circuitry, the oscillator circuitry for the crystal. When you pull it out, it disconnects the pull-up resistor, and then when you put it in the top row, it hooks up the oscillator. I don't actually think I have a crystal spare to try. I had a look. Uh, the button is actually for the user interface which is, well, uh, you press and hold it and you get this menu which allows you to do various things. Uh, no PSU, I believe this turns it, sets it to power saving mode so that it doesn't, it stops measuring if there's no signal. Uh, add and sub allow you to do offsets for uh, measuring differences in frequencies. It's apparently useful for shortwave radio, which I know nothing about. Uh, zero, uh, yeah, that undoes an add or a sub. Table is something to do with crystals. And quit just goes back to uh, frequency measurement mode. I cannot imagine anything I want to do involving the user interface at all. I just don't need any of those features. It's interesting that they managed to actually get a complete menu into a single button. It uses short and long presses to do things, which is amazingly cheap. But yeah. Uh, that is the frequency generator. There's actually appeared to be no problems with this whatsoever. All the trouble I had was due to the signal generator and its DC offset, which I wasn't expecting. I would probably recommend this. I may not recommend this. Now I know more about it. I mean, it's perfectly functional. It's just it's got some rather odd built-in assumptions. Was it worth $10? Yeah, I reckon so. Now it's put together and bolted. It's a decent, decently solid box. It seems to do the job. I do actually have a uh, high precision one kilohertz signal source, which is part of the oscilloscope that I tried it on and it registered 1.000. Yeah, anyway, now I have a frequency counter. I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know what you think in the comments.